one. So we are Coastal Impact. Essentially, we are a marine NGO established in 2009 for the purpose of marine conservation, education, and research. And we also own uh, Barracuda Diving, which is probably the first recreational scuba diving center on mainland India. Uh, we, at the moment, we are running a project for uh, uh, coral transplantation, which currently has stopped because of COVID and because of the monsoons. Uh, but we've already transplanted two beds of coral, totaling 94 small pieces. And we should hopefully be out diving and seeing how they are doing in October. Uh, we're also running education programs and campaigns for schools and colleges, like uh, what we did with uh, several different schools all over the country. And uh, this is basically to sensitize people on marine space because it is out of sight, out of mind. So we are trying to increase the awareness. Okay, so next, please. We are conducting a lot of webinars. We have done almost like two dozen webinars till now since COVID. And the next one coming up is the coming Saturday, which is 19th of September on technology for conservation, which is a fascinating subject because Shashank, who owns the company is quite amazing. He's using drones, he's using underwater drones, he's using 3D modeling techniques and various other things to study uh, conservation while staying maybe sometimes even in his own office and he's still doing all this through there. So it's quite interesting. And on 24th of October, we have uh, ethical dolphin tourism experiences with uh, Pooja Mitra, uh, who's the founder of Terra Conscious and Day with the Dolphins. Okay. Uh, you will find web completed webinars. If you have missed webinars, which we've already run, you can find them on YouTube and the links are posted in our, on our website, on WhatsApp, on Facebook, and also on Instagram. So you can watch them at leisure and not miss out. Okay. We have partnered with SSI for this program and they've been very kind enough to give us this platform to run the whole thing on. And uh, SSI is basically like a university for learning diving. And uh, you're not seeing the slides coming up, but they run a lot of ecology courses uh, on uh, the seas, which include turtles, sharks, corals, fish. There are many, many. There are about six to eight different specialities. And all of them have got wonderful online manuals, which uh, you need to pay for, but they're very, very nominal and the information contained in them is absolutely fantastic. So please, even whether you're a diver or a non-diver, you can actually join in and do these. And uh, sorry, we're having a little bit of difficulty with the um, video, but if you wish to enroll into these, please contact barricadediving at gmail.com. And uh, once you've Frankert, uh, what I've done is uh, in the chat window for everyone, I've pasted a link. Uh, they can check okay. the link and they'll be able to check all the courses. That Excellent. Are Excellent. So guys, go ahead, copy the link uh, from the chat window and uh, then you will have access to all the, sorry, you'll have information and then you can decide which course you want to do and then you can uh, go ahead and do that course. Okay. So this is uh, Parag. Parag is the project director of the Pygmy Seahorse uh, program. I am just going to, one minute, let me, sorry. I will just give you an introduction to Parag. I will step out of the window for a minute. Okay. Yeah, Parag has been involved with Pygmy Hawk Conservation Program since 1997 in Assam. And he has partnered with local project partners called Aranyak and Ecosystems India uh, in a collaborative project which has been initiated by the Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust in 1995. And they've also partnered with IUCN, which is uh, International Union for Conservation of Nature and the SSC Wild Pig Specialist Group, which is with the Forest Department and the Government of 
Assam and the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, which is the government of India. So PHCP, which is a short form for Pygmy Hawk Conservation Program, is working towards the conservation, breeding, habitat, conservation, uh, sorry, restoration, reintroduction, and monitoring of reintroduced hogs in addition to previous responsibilities. In the year 2018, Parag took the responsibility of leading the program as project director. And since then, he has been working with only one species in his entire career spanning 23 years. That is serious dedication, guys. Okay, so his motto is one person, one life, one species to save from extinction. And I think we need to take our hats off to Parag because you see very few people who have dedicated their lives to something which most of us don't even know about. But Parag is here to enlighten us about the pygmy seahorse, not pygmy horse, and uh, pygmy hawk, sorry. And uh, we look forward to all the information that you can give us. So Parag, please uh, enable your screen and take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Venkat. Uh, let's share my screen. Can you see my screen now? Yes, I can. If you can just, yeah, that's it. perfect. Okay. Thank you, Venkat. You're welcome. Production. <laughs> Thank you, Coastal Impact. Barakuda Driving India for inviting me to tell the story. This is a story about a small species in tall grassland, about three meter tall grassland in the sub Himalayan grassland in Assam. But it's not a story about only the species, it's a story about uh, an organization working with this species in last 50 years and a program working with this species for last 25 years. Also about a, how a partnership can save a species from extinction. So before telling about the story right now, I will like to take you to the history. 100 years before India got independent. So this, this man, Brian Hodgson, he is an English naturalist, or you can call him as an ethnologist. He was somewhere here, just down the Sikkim, working, looking for species, looking for people, looking for culture and everything. Sanskrit Pandit. And one day, when he was working, one of a tribal hunter brought him a species never known before in the world. And Hudson found a species, he saw the species, he major, he tried to find out, I mean, and he said, this is a new kind of big species. So he named it Porcula. And as the hunter telling him, describing him that the species was found near a salva, and he named it Sal from Sal, Sal, and from Bagan, Vania. So he named it Porcula Salvania. So it was 1847, discovery of pygmy hog from North Bengal, from down in the grassland. This is a discovery of pygmy hog from then. But in 1964, before 64, it was start appearing in all the Terai area of uh, India and Nepal border. So it called uh, Sab Himalayan. This whole area is a grassland in the Sab, Sab Himalayan foothill. But in 1964, another English naturalist, E. P. Gee, when he wrote a book, The Wildlife of India, in that particular book, he said that pygmy hawk might have extinct from the wild, but he, because he never saw it anywhere. There's no evidence of the pygmy hawk anywhere in, in, in the wild, in the entire area. It was his suspicion. 
But another person, Sabar from us, an Indian born naturalist. He born in India and then he went when his father died, he went, they went to England and he's uh, he never gone to school. He loved animals. So he founded is a small island close to England, founded Jersey Wildlife Preservation Trust in 1956. And then he thought that pygmy hawk still might be somewhere, but he didn't know how to find it out. Then this another person, this man, his name is John Tessier Yandel. John Tessier Yandel was from Jersey. And in 1970, he got posted in Assam. Then he went to Jerry and he said, what can I do for you? And Jerry explained him about pygmy hawk. He said, this is, can you try? Because your tea gardens are very close to forest and mostly in the grassland. So can you find these species? John Tesha Yandel came to Assam. He's a senior manager in a tea garden manager in, in uh, tea garden companies and then Williamson Megger companies. Then he inspired his junior managers. He tried to tell them about the species. And as you know, that British are naturally naturalist. So uh, one of his tea garden manager uh, from a very Indo-Bhutan border called Bornodi, close to Bornodi, there was a tea garden called In that tea garden, this young gentleman, Grave, he found pygmy hawk. They put fire in the grassland. The few pygmy hawk escaped from the grass to the Nalas. And tea garden labor captured, bring them in the market. And this was, this message was Richard. He went to the market and bought 12 pygmy hawk from the market right? sometime in March in 1971. So this is a, a published report in, in the, the Times in, in 1979, May 1971. Then it was immediately informed to Gerald Darrell and Gerald Darrell immediately sent his deputy, Jeremy Melinchon, to Assam to confirm about the pygmy hog. Jeremy came to Assam in 1971 and confirmed it as pygmy hog. Then he advised how to keep them pygmy hog in captivity. That was a rediscovery of pygmy hog in 1971. And since then, Jersey Wildlife Preservation Trust, now it's called Darrell Wildlife Conservation Trust, working with pygmy hog. Next year will be 50 years of Darrell working with people. Then in 1970, Gerald Darrell sent his, one of his science guy, William Oliver, to Assam to do more with the hawk. William came to Assam. He was a young gentleman, his MSc, and he came to us. He did a survey in Sub Himalayan grassland. And he found pig in different parts of Assam. He did he captured two pygmy hawk, did a radio telemetry study for the and then he start collecting all information about grassland, pygmy hawk, and also another species found in the same habitat called his feet hair. And in 1983, he published the first scientific report on pygmy hawk. This book is still a Bible for us. In 1978, Gerald Darrell himself came to India to try to find out about pygmy hawk and try to initiate some work to save the species. And he could not found any pygmy hawk in a while, but he saw a few pygmy hawk in captivity and then since he went back he tried to keep posting all his stuff and his 
science team to work on pygmy hog. Let's see what is pygmy hog. Pygmy hog is the smallest pig in the world. This is giant forest hog and this is the pygmy hog, smallest pig in the world. Most interesting thing about pygmy hog is they live many. They cut grasses, very tall grass, and they make a well, uh, I mean, this, uh, this roof of the nest well made that even the heavy rain, it's inside and they need nest throw out the ear here and they keep on changing the nest, they keep on and then when they need to give babies, they give babies there. It's a very hot day, summer day, they go inside the nest. If it's raining, they go inside the nest. The temperature is always cooler in hot days and warmer in, in, in winter. They love lots of roots and tubers and insects. They forage on that. They breed once in a year for three to five babies. And they are very small. You know how small this is a baby of a pygmy hog is 150 gram that small maybe adult animal can weigh about seven to eight kilos and they'll survive up to seven to eight years maybe seven years in while but we have a pygmy hog survive in our captivity maybe 10 years but why they are so rare and why they are facing extinction so they live on grassland, this tall grassland. It's quite interesting story. How this grassland get created? It by the action of the river in sub Himalayan grassland. The river deposits seals, and that from their seals, this grassland uh, get created. But this grassland is not a kind of habitat. It keep on changing from grassland to woodland. So we need to manage the grassland. During British time, they thought of, they tried to copy the people who keeps cattle around the grassland. So they put fire, copy the same thing. They put fire in the driest time of the year. So it will come up. So it's good for mega herbivores, but it's really, really bad for smaller species like pygmy hawk. And the people around the grassland, they let loose their cattle. They themselves go for collecting the minor forest produce. And when they create this kind of pressure on the grassland, grassland will change their character. They will become uh, either woodland or with the uh, wood or the, with the lots of degree that uh, you mean weeds. And this looks like very good green but this is a bad green. I call it is a green desert because this grass, this green greenery, woody, woody plants, it cannot be used by any mega herbivores, even in long run, nobody will use it. So it's like a bad green, not even pygmy hog. And when this uh, habitat start degraded, pygmy hog species to disappear from this habitat. So we call indicator of this health of the habitat. They will first be and other will follow in a long run. So important for many, not only pygmy hog, but also to save the grassland. Let me tell you about the conservation about the pygmy hog. A discovery of pygmy hog, few pygmy hog Zoo, and it was there for a couple of years in, in 1983. And then it was, uh, then uh, after rediscovery, Pygmy Hog was in Tea Garden in 1971, in Guwahati Zoo for three years in Guwahati Zoo, and also similar time in Zurich Zoo. And since 1979, there was no pygmy hog in captivity. Orang National Park, they released two pygmy hog. And in Manas, in 1993, 
inside a core area, a few pygmy, uh, they pan out in a core area and they capture few pygmy hawks from the wild and put them there, thought that they will breed there, but they give lots of food inside that fence area and elephant came to know about pygmy hawk. We have lots of elephant on those areas. Know, know about food, available food there. They hit a fence and it become like a trap. And we have tigers there inside. Python went inside, finished all the population. Got no elephant or no pygmy hog left in that particular area. Seeing all these, beside that, remember, if you know about history of Assam, in the belt of north of Brahmaputra in the, in the western part of Assam, Manas National Park is, that entire area suffered from a separatist movement by a community, started a borderland, uh, and uh, they try to, uh, try to get an area called borderland. So initially it was a good movement that it become like uh, involvement of a lot of miscreants. So they need arms, they destroy all the camps in Manas National Park, killed all 90 rhinos there. And there was really, really whole area was suffered very badly. So 16 years, Manas was suffered so badly it, that there was almost no protections. If you see in this, this whole area in 1988, this was all the dark areas are grassland. And 2016, we lost almost 60% of the grassland. And people go at any time in the grassland in a driest time from October to May, they put fire. All dots are the fire area. And that particular area from May is a breeding season for pygmy hog. And it place was disturbed very badly. There was no provisions at that time. And there was poor management. So entire area, entire area get very much disturbed. And most of the area converted to bad green, full of weeds. So it was really, really difficult time for us, for our conservationists, and also for all rhinos wiped out, pygmy hawk population is shrinking, and it was really, really bad time for everyone. And during that tight period, Darrell was very worried what to do with the species. And William Oliver, the young, young uh, scientist conservation at that time, he became chairman of IUCN Wild Pig Specialist Group. At that time it was known as Pig Pecarism and Hippo Specialist Group. And from IUCN Wild Pig Specialist Group, they, they write the action plan. He, he wrote the action plan about the pygmy hawk. And it was suggested that there should be some conservation actions to start to save the species from extinction. And at that time, only option was to bring few pygmy hawk in captivity as an insurance against extinction. So pygmy hawk was brought to captivity. But in 1993, pygmy hawk was in the two in Manas and in Borno D. And after 1990, pygmy hawk was only in Manas National Park. Pygmy hawk is stuck. Manas National Park with lower hundreds, less than 400, 500, less than 500 least. And the entire sub Himalayan grassland, it was fragmented by only five PAs in Nepal and 11 PAs in India. Large chunk of grassland in Manas, that's it. And pygmy hog is found only in one place with few hundred individuals in Manas. So in 1995, as Darrell proposed to start a conservation program, Darrell will partner with William Oliver, Wild Pig Specialist Group, with Assam State Forest Department and MOF, 
and the Pygmy Hawk Conservation Program Board, which initial goal established at least three wild population. In 2002, Ecosystem India joined as a local partner. In 2018, Arena joined as another local partner to implement the project in India. So we have support from different organizations throughout our project time since 1995. First fund came from European Union to start the conservation program with Startup Bidding Center. So different organizations support us in, in the entire time. And from now we have uh, funding from um, the major fund, the Clarkson Jersey Trust, and this year we got another measure from the Habitat Trust of India. We have a few funding from a few Jews in European uh, Union, I in Europe, mostly JetGap from German, FDPJ, uh, and Bouvel Nature from France. So this is our, at this moment, our funding support. I'll tell you now how we started our conservation program. A, a conservation breeding center in Assam. We have a breeding center at Apista in Guwahati. This is our breeding center. So we bought six pygmy hawk to start our breeding center. We asked for more, but because of uh, different regions, six was allowed to take us for start a breeding program. It's not easy to capture a pygmy hawk. You don't see them. So what you need to do, we put a, a 30 meter long net in one side. And before that, we do a sign survey and we know where pygmy hawk are. And in another side, after 100 meters from that net, you lined up at least 10, 20 elephants with people and chase whatever there. And pygmy hawk will get trapped in, in, in this net. This is William Oliver, this is Dr. Gautam Narayan. They founded the whole program in 1995. 2001, we rescued one male animal. And 2013, we brought three more animal individuals to the captive, increase their genetic diversities. How we manage the pygmy hog? So this is my simple model to manage the activity, a kind of stress-free captive environment. And captive management protocols so it make animal and you know happy animals are or healthy individuals are also happy. they are good breeder and they exhibit natural behavior and those are healthy and exhibit behavior they are fit for release into the wild remember our rules to recover the species send them back in the wild so that they are, we can stop, or we can prevent the extinction. But how you can keep them happy? So we cannot give them all, all the area they have in the wild, but we can copy them. So we create a smaller area, copying the manas with lots of grass within, the, within our enclosures. It looks like a small manas with a little bit of water. They have opportunity to cut grass and build their nest and look for in insects. That is not enough. We need to feed them. We don't know what they eat. We don't know. There's no knowledge about their food before we brought them to captivity. So we tried around 67 food items. Out of that we found they usually eat 32 food items. We give them there two times in a day in different way. And when you keep them in captivity, you need to think about their health and hygiene. So we maintain the enclosure regularly. And if something female dies, so we need to do find out the cause of that regular practice. So we build up our own protocol to maintain. Bidding was not easy because we started with the six and so how to we need to think about long term. Reading and it's not easy to maintain a with a small individual when you start early or when you 
populations with six individuals. So to take help of a couple of software. So one is called Sparks. That is our start book software. We keep all our data in the Spark software. Then we use another software called PMX to make a breeding play, uh, to make a breeding, find a breeding pair. So it tell us the best suitable pair to breed and we check them and if we found them, they are healthy. We try to pair them and they breed. We number all animals with a microchip so that we know who is who and which enclosure they are. And then we find them with the number. Because this looks same, or you cannot just differentiate between two individuals. So you need some, some identifier. So this enclosure number and microchip tell us who is living where. So that's how we so far bred 176 liters for four of them are reared beyond the three months. We maintain 70 in captivity in the two centers. This is our Potasali center, and this is in our Nameri center. We spread the two captivity, two captive center, just to mitigate any uh, catastrophe. So our demographies, our genetic diversity also is doing well, about 80%. Now we have 18 individuals in captivity. 22 of them are in our Bocista Center, 33 of them are put us. And our uh, Guwahati Center is not allowed to visit by any visitors. So we need to tell people, to ask people, uh, we need to expose them to people. So we have uh, two individuals in Guwahati Zoo, and they two of them sent to Junagar Zoo. In Potasali Center, there is a small area where we allow visitors to see the pygmy hog. But this, everything is changed now, completely changed after COVID and another disease. I'll tell that about, about that later. In 2008, population was grown nearly 70, 80 individuals. And we need to think about sending them back to the wild, but we cannot send them straight from our bedding center to wild. We need a bigger area to train them to survive in the wild before releasing. The whole protocol from breeding to pre-release to release is called a soft release process where we select yards from our breeding group from different things and take them to our pre-release center. We have a big enclosures here, like a 40 meters by 80 meters size. And there we maintain them without humans or minimum human interventions and we monitor them through cc cameras we release them when the, when the babies are like five months old separate them from mother and from dead is with well, maybe one or one year younger older than them make a small or five and we release them in these particular enclosures and we feed them very much, very minimum, and then they will, uh, we maintain them for another five months there, and then five, six months, and from there we take them release. And during that time, they hardly see any people. They are far from uh, human habitation. But before releasing them, we need to find the potential release site within Assam. We are looking all the grasslands. We did a surveys. We try to find out the habitat, good habitat indicators. We are looking for three species of grass and two species of herb and the soil type and the flood. They don't live on the flooding areas. So they, don't, they are not in Kajiranga. They are not in a river basin. But one area, Hurang, is very similar to Manas National Park similar species, not get flooded. So we selected Bornodi, Erupai, Orang, and part of Manas National Park to start our work. Start the whole experiment, we start releasing them back in, in Sunai Dupai. And that's how we started our release program. But we need to find out 
how is the grassland in better way. So we advise to put fire entire grassland in one go. Maybe we can do a block and wherever we have uh, this block get burned and block get that remain unburned. So small animal can move during burning from here to this particular block. So they have a shelter. And this can be a source of regeneration of the grass in this area also. So there is some shelter for a few weeks for pygmy hawk. So we start initiating the block burning in Orang National Park first. Also, we try to remove some of the weeds in the area. And as you know, this grassland get converted to woodland as a part of the succession of the habitat. So we try to we try to uh, find out how best we can remove the trees grown on those grassland or try to reduce the tree populations within the grassland. Maybe we can accept one to 10 trees in one square kilometer grassland, not more than that. Also, we advise to impose some pressure so that we there should not, uh, we try to, uh, I mean, stop cattle grazing on that part. So cattle grazing can destroy really grassland very badly. Create a, some kind of uh, on the diversity of the grassland. Also, I've seen generate uh, lots of weed generations in that particular area. So with that, uh, in 2004, we start working with this habitat management releasing back in the pygmy hawk into the wild. Between 2008 and 10, uh, 8, 9, 10, we released 35 pygmy hawk in Sonai Rupai. Then after that, 59 in Orang National Park, 22 in Bornodi Wildlife Sanctuary, and very recently we start releasing pygmy hawk back in Manas this year. Oh, I forgot to tell you one another thing. In, after, uh, I think in 1960s or 60s, uh, slightly modern scientists, they rename it Sas Salvanias. They said pygmy hog is not different from a wild boar or other pig. So they rename, instead of putting them in different genus, they put them uh, the pig genus that's called Sas, Salvanius. But that old man, that man in 1847 was very right. Big study, we found that pygmy hog is a species. It's a mon have only the they the, the rename it Porcula Salvania. That only species of that particular genus surviving in the wild, surviving in the world right now. So we have renamed in 2007. Start uh, working in the reintroduction, it's going on. We have so far, we have 130 pygmy hogs in 13 years. Ornodi to Banas recently. But how we monitor them? How we know where pygmy hog after release they gone? We don't have any technology in hand at that time, at the beginning. So what we do after the burning of grassland in, on, on those release areas, we look for their sign. We look for their barn nest. We look for their droppings. And in some cases, we know where we found a fresh nest or some droppings. We install camera trap. That's how we start monitoring pygmy hawk. Otherwise, we, you don't see them. I never saw them in my life in 23 years, pygmy hog in wild. But what I saw them, I saw them in camera trap. So this is a sign. This is in this map, in all these big red dots are where we release. And these different colors where we saw sign of pygmy hog, burn droppings. And based on that, 
inside the doze area to, to start our experiment with camera trap, we install camera and first time in our life, we found pygmy hog in camera trap. Not only found evidence of breeding a pygmy dog. See, this is two young kids, a couple of weeks old, with their mother in camera trap in Ura in 2017. We found pairs, we found 55 hogs in 20 traps in four locations in, in, in Urag National Park. That was a hope for us. But we, our scientists, are not happy with only those kind of information. We need really, really hard data. To start with, to get data gathering, we need to their ranging pattern, how far they move, where they go, how they spend time. In 1977, William Oliver tried to capture this radio telemetry with fitting two transmit with transmitters on their back. But in 1996, when we captured pygmy hawk, we tried similar transmitter for five hawks and release them back in Manas. And we have data only for a few weeks to about a month or so two. And all the transmitter are either gone or fallen off or something happened. We don't know to those animals. And we try to, we, do, we need to know what happened to those transmitters. They're very good transmitters, but big, quite big. It, we fix those transmitters, similar transmitter, transmitters to pygmy hog in captivity. And we found that it's really, really uncomfortable for pygmy hog, really injured them. So we stopped using all those transmitters. Okay, we now we know why, what was wrong in 1977, what was wrong in 19, 1996. Under that transmitter, then we went to another transmitter, a implant, we just put under the skin. Very good transmitter, but it's big for pygmy hawk. Then we found another transmitter, smaller transmitters, just under the, put under the skin. But those, all those transmitters, not giving us data for long. There's some problem with these transmitters. It either creating injury to the animal, or they stop working after a few, few weeks to a month. Then we went back to another external temperature transmitters with a ear tag, with a small transmitter, with an antenna. We try with different kind of antenna. We try with antenna with nickel titanium. We try with uh, steel antennas. We try with cover. But the, you know, these are very fast moving animals. They move very fast in, within the grassland. So all these antennas broke within a few weeks to a month. We don't have data from uh, hawks for. Then in 2017, I went to Vienna Veterinary University. They have a lab there, antenna, a design transmitter. So I work with uh, Professor Chris Wall and we design a very small antenna, which is a small which antenna inside. The implant. 2017 December and 2018 inserted those inside the pygmy in captivity first to try. Then those animals we release eight animals we release in a while. We inserted them there with following the all surgical protocols, and it's really really good. We have data. We know the, how far they move, where they move, and all the ranging patterns and different behaviors. We have now data for about a year. It tells us their requirement of the area, and it tells us answer to many unknowing questions we start asking before. So it solves us our problem of transmitting or, uh, or knowing them but also it lasts for about a year, but that's a really, really good transmitter. With a lot of training and in 
we have uh, students doing phds master studies we have lots of volunteers we train about animal monitoring conservation breeding so we have students from different parts of the world that was till 2017 17 a daril wildlife conservation trust we are looking for a the big dream we have a rewild our world we dream in 2025 it would have been a daril Gerald Darrell would have been 100 years our founder of the Conservation Trust. So we try to design a, a project planning program planning for 2020-2025, working with 10 different ecosystems with 100 threatened species, with 500 endangered obligate species, and connecting wild 1 million people. So it's called, we call it rewilding dream, rewild our species or our area. So one of our site is in Assam. So we are concentrating now with that plan in Manas National Park with our goal to work with, with working with five different species along with the pygmy hawk, with the habitat, and few obligate species with, with this is the Bengal Florican, the bird, his pig hair, hog deer, and a mega herbivore score, water buffalo. But dream, we can we think we can restore the sub Himalayan grassland, bring back the bring back the biotic manager, all the they were used to manage the grass then because of our action our past action or our action we destroy the grassland and it become unused for this biotic manager now we need our abiotic management practices to revive this grass and restore this grassland so that we can hand it over to them. With that objective, we are we have started population monitoring of pygmy hawk and other obligate species. We have started working with Bengal Florican. A student recently did her masters on Bengal Florican monitoring in Manas National Park. We are now constantly working with camera trapping upgrading our protocols, looking for sign survey. At the same time, we try to find out where pygmy hogs are. We found pygmy hog in last two years, we try to do camera tapping. We found pygmy hog here and here. But pygmy hog is absent in the area from where we captured pygmy hog in 1996 and uh, 2013. And recently we have reintroduced pygmy hog in this particular block of grassland and we have to release 60 pygmy hogs in the next five years from this year. At the same time, to find out how we can manage this habit this is a very successional habitat who is keep on changing. So our, our field biologist is working constantly design a best practice. We have now in the grassland, try to do different experiments to find a practice to manage the grassland to stop the succession of the habitat. We are consulting with the different experts. We are telling our stories to others also. Maybe in the next five, five years, we'll be able to give a hands-on document so that that can be followed for another five years to see and we definitely will be able to make a change in the whole grassland management practice in the sub and grassland. With that, if we have a very good grassland restored and recovered grassland, maybe we can able to contribute this serious problem as you know might be the human elephant conflict 
in this part of the world. At the same time, we need to think about reconnecting the people. These people who live close to grassland, they use minimum natural resources from the grassland. Maybe cats, maybe few woods. They are not like us, people living in the city. If you see their cultures, if you see their dress, if you listen their music, it tells everything about nature. If, for example, if this lady, if you see the her dress, it's a she copied it from the hornbill. You see, it's like yellow, black, yellow, black, white, and all the flowers are from nature. Their colors, nature. And there, if you listen their music, their song from nature, but they lost connection. Now we need to think about how we can, how can rebuild their connection with the nature. What is the problem? What is the drivers? Why they need to really exploit those connections? How they can uh, get the ecosystem services from the uh, nature, from the manas? So we are our field team, our community team. We have now a professional community team. Uh, we are they are working closely with the community to try to find out the drivers why they go in and try to help try to design some engagement plan so that we can reduce the anthropogenic pressure with the community habitat trust is supporting us this particular effort to work with the community right now so we, this is our long term vision revive the grassland of manas national park our home to a developed community and act as a model of sub Himalayan grass and restorations. Hopefully, able to solve problems of this area and maybe hope for a few things living close to the grassland. Hope to really rewild or restore the sub Himalayan grassland and hand this, all this to the wildlife and they will manage and we can restore this whole ecological process. We are working towards that particular goal. We have very long-term vision now. We have a plan to work with pygmy hog and entire sub-Himalayan area, work with grassland and the entire, uh, the entire area, including Nepal. We are looking for our partners in everywhere so that we can work to save the, not only the species, but this very important ecosystem. Now I tell you recent challenges. As we have with this webinar, maybe this is output of this challenge, COVID lockdown. I can tell you the day there was, they declared a lockdown. I was in Manas with my field team. One student was doing her Bengal Forican study and my few friends, my other colleagues are working with the grassland. Then we heard about that morning, we heard about the lockdown from next day. I was with a student, Forican. We thought of, we have to go back to our home now from next day morning. While driving in the grassland, I thought, Let's ask this forest guard. They are living so inside. Do they, do, do they know about this new disease? Do, do they know about how to protect themselves? Because tomorrow we'll be going to our and they will they will stay in the forest. And if something goes to them, there'll be there will there'll be nobody to protect the animals. So the habitat, there'll be nobody. And I start asking. So they heard about this, they don't know anything about that. So what we did immediately, we went to, I think, eight forest camp in our area and try to tell them what is hand washing practice, what is social distancing, what about the disease. And by the time I think we cover around 
uh, I mean, we went to eight, eight camps, maybe covered around, around 20 individuals, all camp ninjas, explained them whatever we knew about the disease. At the same time, in captive centers, in both the centers, we need to find, we, need, we would usually go for buying the food for market from the local food markets. And high hour, the everything is going to be closed now. We have food for at least for just for seven days. Then what will do that? Then I call the Guwahati Zoo director because he had a supplier. So I think he can, can he help? Can he send his supplier to get a box at Guwahati? So he's kind enough. He's the supplier to us and they supplied food to us. Or sitting outside. But what we'll do in Manas, uh, in Nameri Center, in a no big place. So we try to interact with the locals. They grew lots of fruits and we buy the fruits from the market. And we, our people there, the inchers, he went to the village, try to discuss the whole thing with the village people. And they said they fruit directly to our center. So they are bringing the food to us. As an emergency essential service, I was allowed to travel from different places. And when I go to any villages, I collect all the food I can and load in my car and bring back to our centers. That's how we managed the COVID lockdown in, in, in the, the, at the beginning. But from April, when uh, last part of the COVID lockdown, another challenge came to us. It was not a challenge for the people, but for an elephant, uh, for the animal. A disease, a pig disease, its name is African swine fever. It reached Assam. And this is a deadly disease. If it reached to Assam, or it reached to our captive center, I think all pig, pig will die, all pig will die. This disease came to know in the well, all in a big, big, big owner. So in 1970, 1921, it emerged the disease in Kenya. And from there, all over Europe, then to China in 2018. March 2019, it, it came very close to us, somewhere here. And it, Bruna cell produce. I think it, this, carried that disease to Arunachal, to India, and to Assam in beginning of this year, and start appearing the disease. Of and we are not prepared for that. We are that kind of biosecurity, and everything was closed, locked down, so you cannot get medications, other things. So immediately, what we need to, and it was in 2000, in, in, in April, it was just 10 kilometers away from our center. So we have to immediately implement some kind of biosecurity. We cannot allow people to come in, even not my keeper. So immediately install some kind of shower facility so that we, our staff can come in, they can take a shower, they can take a food dip, they can change their clothes and they can come in. And all the bedding material need to be washed with a medication. And we buy whatever bedding material available in the market, those were collected before the African swine fever in Assam to store it at least for a year. But this needs to be a permanent solution and we don't have money. Our main uh, partner, Daril Wildlife Conservation Trust, the zoo in Jersey that was closed. There's no income in that kind. Our uh, funding support from Europe revoked the funding because there's no money. All Europe, Europe was closed. France Zoo said they, they can, may, may not be able to send money. Uh, Bouvel Zoo. Then I spoke, then one of the, one of the reviewing our funding thing with uh, Trisa, she's uh, the, the trust. I, I told her that this is happening and I, me a proposal right now. She gave me two hours. I immediately wrote my uh, counterpart colleague in Jersey that maybe we can send a proposal to the Habitat Trust. 
we 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 wrote a proposal within two hours and sent it to Trisa, and Trisa sent us money. Now we are making everything in permanent. You can see this permanent structure is happening here. The Habitat Trust sent us this all money. So we are converting this our facility. So people will step in here, they will wash them, and then they will change the clothes and they can go for work with animal. This is happening now. So we are converting all this. Hopefully we'll be able to tackle this challenge and keep our pygmy hogs safe and keep our work going on. But very recently, the day before yesterday, a news came in a newspaper called The Guardian in UK. Then one study conducted by a researcher, they found out 48 species was saved from by the conservation effort. And one of the hog, if you see pygmy hog, it's not going to extinct anymore. New our study. So it was safe from extinction. And it is the only species in this. But still, if you see a species, we are somewhere in between these. There is, there is a long way to go. 70 years species of uh, 50 years working with a species for Darren Wilder Conservation Trust, 24 years working with under this project program we are working with from extinction. Still we need to we need a we need to travel all this way to save the species from extinction. Save the species. It's safe from extinction right now to recover the species we need we need to we have a long journey ahead. But we have a plan, we have a great plan, we have a dream. We believe our plan, our partners believe our plan. I think we are able to accomplish this great thing. Thank you. Wow, Prag, thank you very much for that very informative presentation. Very, very interesting and you know, this is one of the few success stories I have heard because always there is bad news everywhere about animals heading to extinction. But this is actually a revival story, uh, which is very heartwarming. So I need to ask you a very important question, uh, which is, which one, which love in your life came first? Was it the wild hog or was it your wife? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Uh, actually, I, when I, I married to one of my, uh, we grew up together actually with my, together in the same town. Okay. But uh, when we were very young, young uh, we played together. She was my playmate. Big Hog is my first family. Everybody knows about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. All right. That's wonderful. I mean, my yes, family are human. They can manage themselves, but these uh, species yes. need us. Yes. Okay. Uh, in your presentation, I don't think I heard you mention what is the actual uh, area of a pygmy seahorse. Pygmy hog. The ter okay. territory. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I can show you actual area of things. Uh, where is the map? Okay. Can you see my map now? Yes. So this population was once this entire sub Himalayan area. Okay. No, no, no. I mean individually now, of one pygmy seahorse. Okay. What is the territory? Our, territory. Ah, okay, okay, okay. So our recent study. Mm -hmm. In in recent study of bio radio telemetry tells that it it might travel two hundred uh, meter. Okay. So okay. It, uh, and they need an area about two square kilometer area. Okay. Two, sorry, four to five square kilometer area to establish a population, but two hundred meter from their nest. Right. And are, the, are they social animals? Yes, they live on a small group, about four or five individuals. Okay. And male usually, male usually join the female during breeding season. Otherwise, he will try to remain isolated, but close to the close to the. 
Okay. I think I'm uh, too inclined to be uh, in the sea. Uh, Siddharth has just told me I that I keep see. saying pygmy sea horse. Okay. I'm sorry. Ah, no, it's okay. <laughs> no, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. We have a few more questions on our uh, yes. Q&A window. How can a common uh, human contribute to conservation program of the pygmy sea? Not pygmy horse. <laughs> <laughs> How can uh, I mean different ways? I mean, how can I mean what human? You mean if you if you are scientist or if you are no a general person like say me, how can we contribute to a conservation program of the hawk? Tell our story to everyone. Tell these stories. I tell this. Uh, uh, tell tell about this kind. This can happen. Okay. Right. That's one thing. And second thing, if you want to really, as a young student, or you want to join as an intern, you join as a volunteer, you can mm -hmm. welcome, you can write to us. And What is your average internship uh, period that you ask for? Minimum two weeks. Two weeks. And yeah, do you have to be of a scientific background or science background or anything like that? Or it's not important? We have different options. We have a community team. Mm -hmm. Those who work with community a team working with uh, the grassland mm -hmm. and the population monitoring if somebody want to do that but that's uh, these are really very hard work we have a two captive breeding center so we can accommodate if you want to really work with animal so we have facilities in all places to keep uh, students and mm -hmm. uh, your uh, volunteers we have okay all of our world and mm -hmm. then uh, but now onwards uh, because of this uh, african swine fever we have to follow a different protocol we can mm -hmm. still accommodate still accommodate but it's a really really hard protocol now also uh, we have got covid now to worry about i guess so it's even more difficult yeah covid but we are more worried about uh, african swine fever than covid <laughs> okay yeah yeah i understand and are they eaten by humans pygmy dogs yes yes Human is everything. Yeah. Human is everything. <laughs> if, if, some, if, if, if it's a crawl, accept train. If it's a fly, accept flight. Everything. Is everything. <laughs> also, is a question. Have you written any book on this? Me? No. Yes. <laughs> there are lots of book. Lots of book uh, about uh, this, and lots of good writer wrote about our story, starting mm -hmm. from Jane Goodall to. Bahar oh, Jane Goodall, I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Bahar Dutt to Jane Goodall to Gerald Durrell. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, I mean, there are good uh, short documentaries also on us. Uh, Excellent. People, okay. People can see them. All right. And, and Karthik is asking a yeah. question How can we contact and apply for internship? I guess that is through your website. Yes, uh, we recently we applied, we advertised for uh, intern working mm -hmm. for grassland it was in arenak website they will find you but also you can write to me directly okay i think uh, and send your cv okay all right great uh, if you can just type in your email id in the chat window uh, karthik can uh, okay. copy that yeah uh, I Right. Where, where is <laughs> sorry? Uh, at the bottom. Yeah. Anyway, can we write it down? Porag Deka P A R A Z dot. D E K A at the red Darrell D U R R E double L dot O R Z. Yeah, that's yeah. I think uh, Siddharth has already typed that out as well. Yeah, great. All right, I think we have run out of questions and we have also run out of time. So, yes. Parag, thank you so much. For joining us. First Thank you for yeah. I know you have a busy schedule and you're again heading <laughs> off into the wild again tomorrow. That's no, fine. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very interesting. <laughs> and we will, of course, have the recorded version of this uh, on uh, uh, YouTube, and we will spread awesome. the link to everybody so that more and more people can actually see this and uh, get themselves educated and understand the important work you're doing. I will leave with one last question. What happens tomorrow if the pygmy hog disappears? How will it affect the environment? <laughs> I think people need to understand the importance of that. Yes. So we call the pygmy hog is a indicator of the good grassland. We call right. it the yeah. barometer of the grassland. Right. We call it as a health indicator of the grassland. Mm -hmm. If an indicator goes, then we don't know what's going to happen. What going? What is? What is the wrong in in the grassland? This sub Himalayan grassland. Okay. Right. Okay. It's very important okay. to uh, keep your thermometer safe at home. Otherwise, yes. you don't know what is your temperature. Very true. Very true. So that's the thermometer or barometer of the grassland. Okay. I think there was and one you... last question by another person. He's saying that now that you have saved the pygmy hog, what are you going to move on to next? But I think you've already answered that question. Yeah, we are. We have not saved yet. We are we a long way to go from extinction, yeah. but it's long way to go. Complete recovery of the species. So, so you, you know, are usually, well really committed to that. Yeah, yeah. usually, uh, so far there are many species have been recovered. Mm -hmm. Usual time period is thirty-six years. Oh my God! For yeah. species, if you say the Californian condor, it's a species for thirty-six years. If you see wow. a pink pigeon, see a Mauritius crystal, those mm -hmm. are average 30 to 30 years. So you have to break so that record. Have 10 more years to go with. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you will break that record. <laughs> no, no, <maybe> yeah. <laughs> so that's, 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 a, that's a recovery, species recovery timeline. Okay. All right. So thank you so much for being here. Hats off to you and your team. I think you're doing a fantastic job. And uh, good luck with, with all these difficult times. I hope you continue to get your funding and continue to do good work. Thank you very much. Thank you to all. Thank you to all people who give us support. Thank you particularly to Habitat Trust giving us such a uh, Yes, I think they've been wonderful. Very quickly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And we're looking for a long partner with them. Yes. For other, working with other areas. And thank you Wonderful. to all. And I invited you all to come whenever you come to Assam. Just give would us love to. We'd love to come and <laughs> see those cute yeah. little hogs of yours. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you have to go a certain protocol, but you can see them. That's okay. Yeah. All right. Great. Thank you. And thanks, SSI, Bye. Bye. for this platform once again. And thanks, thanks to the audience for hanging in there and seeing the program through. All right, guys. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Good night.